morning, uh, colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, Dean uh, Gilpin. It is a pleasure for me to come back to the Africa Center. As the Dean mentioned, I started with the Africa Center here in 1999, and I recall as we were moving down to this building, we had not yet moved here. We used to stay across on the other side in Arlington. I came over every so often to a dean's meeting that started at 7 in the morning. It was extremely torturous to have to drive from home and arrive here at 7. So my introduction to the military. So coming in this morning was quite a reminder about 15 years ago and how much I hated every morning. <laughs> Not of my work, but of the drive and the discipline that had, uh, had to be introduced. Now let, let me just uh, start with one minor uh, problem, an update to my bio. And I say so because it is relevant to what I'm going to talk about. I have since uh, May of last year moved to South Sudan as uh, the director for human rights in the UN mission to South Sudan and the representative for the High Commissioner for, uh, for Human Rights. I moved to South Sudan at a very critical moment somehow with a dream that I was going to go out there to make a contribution to state building. But as you know, the last six months, we've spent a great deal of time trying to sort out very <coughs> fundamental issues about the collapse or potential collapse of a state. And so I think that some of the experience that South Sudan has gone through in the last six months is extremely pertinent to your discussion about security sector reform and the rule of law. And so what I want to do in the very short time that I have is use some of that experience and some of what we've been going through in South Sudan over the last six months to illustrate what, in my view, is the absolute indispensability of the rule of law in constructing any kind of uh, uh, security infrastructure. And I would argue that as you go through the process of security sector reform, if you don't ground your security sector in the rule of law, its sustainability will be questionable. Now, one might argue South Sudan is a unique case, it is different, but I would submit to you that in fact if you reflect deeply enough, you will not see too much of a difference. Let me rephrase that. I think each one of us could very easily end up in the same situation that South Sudan is in. Let, let me backtrack a little bit here and say a few words about the idea of the rule of law. From very broadly, and I don't want to sound academic here, I just want to give you some very key parameters to define our conversation. The rule of law is the idea that government authority and all our actions should be grounded in some previous, previously established law. In other words, that every single thing that a state does, and a state would include obviously its security infrastructure, should be grounded in law. There are a number of key propositions in this notion. One is that obviously there has to be reasonably well-established laws. The laws that are adopted through a normal constitutional uh, process. Underlying the idea behind uh, legislation or laws is that notion of separation of powers. In other words, that uh, those who make the law should not be the same as those who apply it, should not be the same as those who interpret it. Hence, the notion of three separate branches of government that I think has become typically standard fare in most countries today. The legislative branch makes the law, the executive branch is a, is a charge with the application of that law. And should there be any dispute at all about the interpretation or the application of that law, it is the role of the judiciary to adjudicate, to interpret that law, and to apply it in appropriate <clears throat> circumstances. Each one of those branches has to be separate and independent from the other. Because if the executive were to be the one to start making the laws, then obviously you no longer have the idea of the rule of law. 
because you can bend the law as you go along to adapt it or suit it to whatever uh, you would like to do. Very, very interesting concepts here. We don't have time to get into that, but if you have any questions in that idea from a lawyer's perspective, uh, I'll be happy to, to talk about that. Now, how does the rule of law apply to security sector or to the security establishment? Again, here you will forgive me, I'll be very, very brief in addressing this subject because I think that it's more interesting perhaps to listen to questions and to engage in a, in a dialogue. I think, uh, as I said earlier, the rule of law should be the foundation of any kind of a national security strategy uh, or a security infrastructure in a country. Meaning that, first and foremost, the security sector must be grounded in law. It must be grounded in clearly defined legislation that outlines what the security sector is, what are its different components, what is its role, what are its institutions, and so on and so on. And that legal foundation then becomes the basis for the operation of the security sector uh, as a whole. Its purpose, its mandate, its structure, and so on. Secondly, the law should define very clearly also what I suppose many of you in the military sector might refer to as the rules of engagement. When do you deploy that security sector? What is its role? When can it be used? Under what circumstances? Particularly when it comes to the issue of the use of lethal force or restraint on individual liberty. Sometimes the security sector gets involved in issues of crowd control and so on. That has to be very clearly uh, defined. Third, there has to be an oversight mechanism. Oversight in a number of different ways, but first and foremost, the idea that the operation of the security sector itself has to be subject to control by another organ uh, of government. It operates under the executive branch, but in most societies, that oversight would be exercised by the legislative branch, by parliament, an area of tremendous amount of tension and debate even in this country where, of course, the security sector constantly argues that it ought not to be subject to uh, the oversight of uh, the uh, civilians, the idea of civilian civil control uh, of, the, uh, of the military or of the security sector uh, more generally. Without that notion of oversight, the idea of uh, uh, the rule of law would not be applicable to a security sector. Fourth, the notion of accountability is extremely important and central to the security sector and to the rule of law more generally. Accountability, again, has many different uh, dimensions. One of them is that whenever you exercise uh, the uh, authority or the, the, the exercise of uh, the, the, the power of the security sector obviously has to be subject to uh, the uh, review by another organ of government. And that applies in a lot of different ways in different countries. We shall not get to that. It includes the budget process, obviously, the uh, uh, allocation of the resources. It also relates to the operations. And there is an element that relates to the in individual accountability, and I'll illustrate that a little bit more in the case of uh, South, uh, South Sudan. And the final element of the rule of law as it applies to security here, and I'm, I'm saying final, not in the sense that this is a comprehensive kind of a, uh, analysis or review, but rather some of the key elements, uh, is the individual dimension, that the actors in the security sector themselves must be subject to the rule of law. In other words, they must derive their authority from specific legislative uh, mandate. Uh, I haven't mentioned the Constitution here, but it's obviously at the pinnacle of the sort of legal basis that uh, is to be uh, uh, used. Uh, and when there is any wrongdoing by an individual member uh, of the security sector, that ought to be subject to accountability processes. Let me, let me turn to the case of South Sudan here uh, and uh, very briefly just share with you what South Sudan has experienced since December 15th. Uh, it has been in the news a lot. You no doubt have heard about the, uh, what is now being referred to as a civil war uh, in the country that started on the night of December 15th at the end of uh, what was supposed to be a conference of the legislative uh, 
organ uh, in South Sudan. There was a dispute between the president and his former vice president. Soon enough, in the middle of the night, a fight started in one of the military barracks. The narrative varies somewhat, depending on who you talk to. But from what we have gathered, what happened there was that there were two factions of the presidential guard unit, one loyal to the president and another one loyal to the vice president, or maybe it turned out that way. There was an ethnic dimension as well. The one loyal to the president was predominantly from his ethnic group. The one to the vice president was predominantly also from his ethnic group. They fought each other through the night into the next day. The vice president's uh, faction was defeated. So they moved out of Juba, out of the town, the capital, and moved to the outskirts. In the following days, government troops went around this, the city of Juba, picking up individuals who belonged to the other ethnic group, and killed quite a few. Extrajudicial killings to a large extent. And uh, we don't know the numbers, but some people argue that probably as many as 10,000 people were killed during that, uh, that period. The fighting, and I'll truncate the story here because it takes a long time to tell it, but the fighting went on extensively, and it still continues now, six and a half months later. It's fighting not so much in Juba, but the, the two groups are contesting and fighting against each other. There have been very many defections from uh, the military side, including last week, a top general defected and joined the opposition. The opposition is galvanizing and mobilizing local youths to come and join its ranks to continue the fighting. Overall, across the country, there have been very, very intense fighting with heavy civilian casualties. Uh, ho towns have been burned <coughs> down completely. We have had uh, probably up to a million people displaced now out of the country from their homes. But this is just to give you a sort of a sense, very broadly speaking, of uh, South Sudan. Now you may ask yourself, what does that have to do with what I said earlier? What does that have to do with uh, the rule of law at all? And uh, to what extent is this relevant to the conversation that you're going to have about security sector reform? Well, let me point to a number of things here. Number one, I think there was a fundamental issue with the legal basis and the framework of the security sector overall. South Sudan is new, as you know. They got independence on July 9th, 2011. They were still in the process of working out the sort of the legal basis. Their army was constituted mainly of people who were fighting in the bush wars, and they were fighting their allegiances were to individual commanders, individual uh, uh, military leaders. The notion of constituting them into a national security infrastructure with very key uh, instructions and very clear directions was not yet well uh, established. Secondly, very clearly as the things unfolded, it was evident that the loyalty of the security sector was more to the individuals who were leading the country rather than to a constitution or to a country. I think a lesson there, a very fundamental lesson to learn obviously is the critical importance of having a national security force whose loyalty is to the established institutions of a country, more fundamentally to the constitution and to the people, as opposed to one group or uh, the other. Third, the very notion of the operation of the security sector itself. Now, some people argue that there was a breakdown, that there was a breakdown in chain of command and uh, during two or three days of absolute chaos, whatever was established in place broke down. But I think that begs the question, why did it break down in the manner that it, uh, it did? And why did it start taking on that element of ethnic affiliation or individual uh, loyalty? And more importantly, why is it that the civilians became the casualties of the security sector as they moved along? Uh, in the uh, in the country, thank you. <coughs> Related to that is the conduct of the individuals in the security sector themselves. Now I have talked primarily of the SPLA, the South Sudan, no, the Sudan People's Liberation Army, but there were several other elements to the security sector. There was the Presidential Guard. You had uh, uh, a special unit 
referred to as the special forces, there was national security. The distinction among these different elements of the security sector were not very clear. But during the conflict and at the beginning of it, almost all of them were involved in different degrees in the fighting in the country and in, in the, uh, the, the level of, uh, of, of, uh, of atrocities. But more fundamentally here, the individual members of the security sector then turned themselves into uh, individual actors who were pursuing an agenda that is not one that one could describe as national in nature or related to, uh, to, to security more, more generally. And we are now beginning to follow the process of accountability as part of the UN and the international community as a whole to try to determine precisely what happened and to emphasize the notion that uh, impunity leads to insecurity. And in the case of South Sudan, there's a backdrop to this story because some 23 years ago, there was a fight, very similar one. They were not yet an independent nation, but the actors were about the same. When there was a major uh, uh, catastrophe, an execution of more than 3,000 people by troops that are loyal to the current leader of the rebel movement, uh, the former vice president. It was mainly targeted at a particular ethnic group, the same ethnic group as the president's. We argue that there was a problem of impunity there because the way that that conflict was settled was to say, after they fought, several years later, they shook hands and said, we are now one people, let us move ahead and reestablish a country. <clears throat> now, the experience, obviously, of the last six months indicates very clearly that that approach does not work. It's important to hold individuals accountable and to have the institution as well uh, accountable. And I think this is an important dimension here uh, with respect to the idea of, uh, of the rule of law. So we are going through with the accountability element at uh, two levels. There's one that is individual, is looking at uh, done uh, through the national level to try to investigate and determine who indeed was uh, primarily responsible and how they can be called to book. But there is also a level at which uh, I think the, 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 the overall orientation is to look at the state as an institution and the leadership of it all and determine the degree of their responsibility. Now, I don't have too much time to get into this, but let me leave you with a number of questions here. Number one, is South Sudan unique, as I suggested earlier? Could we argue that what has happened in South Sudan is an aberration? I think if you pause back to the history of Africa over the last few years, it might be interesting to see how uh, we come out on those uh, different elements. Secondly, had there been a well-established democratic establishment in the country with institutions, would we have ended up with the kind of result that South Sudan ended up with? Now, clearly, there are some deep-seated political issues in that country. But I think part of what I'm also presenting you with here is a question about how do you solve those problems? Because again, the ethnic issues in South Sudan are not unique. And the entire orientation of political process in South Sudan, as well as it's, uh, the, the way that its security infrastructure was arranged, <coughs> is not something that is very dissimilar from what you would encounter in a lot of uh, uh, different places. And so the challenge here for us all is, how do we end up addressing some of these things in a manner that establishes a security infrastructure that fulfills the national objective as opposed to perpetuating perhaps some of these deep-seated uh, divides? In uh, just a few final words, right now, uh, as you know, there is a peace conference that is going on in Addis Ababa. Uh, the last two days, both sides have withdrawn from the peace talks because of one was very angry because the IGAD, uh, head of the IGAD secretariat in the middle of last week made a public announcement calling them to shame because he argued that uh, they were being stupid for focusing more on their military agenda as opposed to resolution of the dispute. So as a result, they both withdrew from the talks. It's not going on anymore. But the agenda of the peace process, aside from settling the political dispute, 
there are two primary issues that we are putting on the table, and I'm saying here we in terms of the United Nations. One is that security sector reform is absolutely crucial for South Sudan to move forward. They cannot reestablish democracy or the viability of the state of South Sudan unless there is a fundamental reform of the security sector. And in reforming the security sector, the kinds of things that we are referring to are centered very much around the idea of the rule of law. You have to define very clearly what sort of security sector you want. It has to be grounded in well-established legislation with allegiance to the Constitution. There has to be clear mechanisms of oversight uh, along the way with respect to every key element of the operation of that uh, security sector, and you must put in place a mechanism for accountability across the board again, from the top to the bottom. The second thing that we are trying to address here is the issue of accountability, and I've already talked a lot about that, but I'm saying it very briefly here. The idea here is that accountability has to look, be looked at again from two perspectives. Number one, what has happened already? How do we bring to book those who have been responsible for the human rights violations in the country? And secondly, drawing a lesson from that, how can you enshrine the notion of accountability in whatever security infrastructure is established in South Sudan? Because without that, it would be hardly possible for the country to set itself on the right path. Thank you.